All right, then. Without, uh, I, I mean, any of you could, uh, could get a capsule if you'd like. Uh, during the workshop, it'll just have to wait till we're finished with it uh, to get going here. Uh, but let's get back to things. Uh, I have some sage wisdom highlighted on the screen here. Uh, levers lead to, or levers, uh, lead to doom for dungeon delvers. So amidst that, talking about uh, what we do at our tables, what happens, and uh, between uh, a, a natural 20, a story of a natural 20, on a, a maneuver called Monkey Monkey Grabs the Peach, uh, then uh, we're, we're having quite a fun time tonight. Uh, so cheers to you all. You all are amazing, and I'm, I'm so fortunate to be able to spend evenings with you as I do. A paladin, a paladin doesn't have to ruin that option. I, unless I'm missing a condition of your game, old port, a paladin doesn't always have to just murder everything that's out there. I, I know the phrase lawful good doesn't mean lawful nice, but that doesn't mean you have to kill everything around. Guess it might depend on the on the tenants or the oath or the mission that you were given by your your deity or your uh, non-warlock patron, like a, a noble or a king whom you serve. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, that. yeah, if it's a part of their tenants to, to murder everything. So... Uh, that said, there's you can always pull back on that. Uh, you know, you could come up with a reason. If you need help, <clears throat> that's why we're here. So we have Grimtooth's Traps open for some inspiration. And what I'd like to do, along with this dungeon concept worksheet, that will draw on the lessons that we explored in the five-room dungeon and then the seven things that a dungeon must have. Well, not must. You get what I'm saying. Seven things a dungeon should have. You're, oh, you're, you're dual boxing, Master Mage. You're, and Misfit says, my pally, my pally wasn't a murder hobo. He tried to beat everyone into submission then if they weren't evil and then conscript them. Yeah, you don't always have to land a killing blow. Now, the the book says you can only do it with melee weapons, but personally, you know, can you describe uh, landing a knockout blow with an arrow or a fireball? I'm fine with that. If you can describe it, I'm, I'm open-minded. So the dungeon that we manufactured last night takes place in this giant gem that is at the top of this volcanic caldera lake and from the villain creation the npc creation the setting creation all of these other documents that we had created together in our workshops it's lending itself that the story was that there was a drow the, the drow had lived here as outcasts as they are worshippers of Elias uh Elastrae it, it's weird cuz it's it's like an a with an elongated e as well i think i'm pronouncing it correctly Elastrae uh Derek i, I don't know if, if you know that cuz i know drow are definitely your business um but if anyone out there if i'm mispronouncing it please let me know and uh, and so that's like the one good goddess of the drow so they're outcasts, they're, they're hunted. And so they moved out this way to this harsh Arctic environment. And, uh, and so one of them, who is a druid of the land that we rolled, uh, ended up, you know, perhaps even leading her people, being very special, and then making contact with the, the old natives of the area, which are dragonborn, as we were rolling through prompts. Uh, she ends up having a... Uh, a, a taboo love, so to speak, uh, perhaps with a chieftain or someone else who's important. And uh, with her enormous power, she called down uh, the powers of this goddess and was ascending and became this half dragonborn, half drow. So statistically, she's a half elf. Um, you know, or not statistically, mechanically, she's a half elf. We're 
cosmetically describing her as a mix of Dragonborn and Drow, as a blessing from this goddess. A drow, yeah, so we, we rolled a drow circle of the land druid. Well, she's technically half half drow, um, but she, in the story, because of all the prompts that we rolled in, in our imagination and our creative storytelling, that, oh, E-L-S tre E-L-S tre E-L-S tre E. E-L-S tre E. E-L-S tre E. Five syllables. E L S T R E E. E L S T R E E. Okay. Yeah, God names are fun. <laughs> I mean, look, you get cord. Yeah, I'm cord, god of strength. And then you get, you know, Lolth. Lolth. I'm the slithering, spidery demon goddess of the drow. And then you get Elis Treyi, uh, which is a more elegant, uh, a more elegant name that, to many who might have difficulty pronunciating, uh, pr pronunciating, pronouncing it, it would be the equivalent of stupid, sexy Flanders, from Homer Simpson. It takes cues from Japanese, hence why multiple vowels. Mm -hmm. We're getting the inside knowledge from Derek. Thank you, Derek, for letting me know. Cord, yes, god of glorious battle and uh, strength, uh, feats of strength. Uh, then, uh, who apparently presides over Festivus <laughs> for the rest of us. Or you just go Forgotten Realms where Salune was the uh, good goddess for Drow. Alice Treyer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Y'all worship Alice Treyer. Yeah, we know all Alice Treyer. Good gal. She's uh, a bit different. Uh, I think she's uh, excluded from her community. If it helps, LS Trey is commonly. Eh, I, I'll practice the five syllable. I'm fine with that. Elis Trey. Elis Trey. Elis Trey. Elis Trey. Or LS Trey. Oh my. <laughs> this is a goddess of trickery and deception. Yeah, the, them Treyers a great family. Uh, I, I think the one boy's a little, a little touched, but uh, you know, a little water on the brain. But uh, you know, he's not so bad. He's got muscle, helps his paw on the farm like no one's business. Yeah, she's a uh, moon goddess, correct, Derek? Uh, I mean, she's chaotic good. So she's a, ooh, a, a good goddess, which of course makes her the evil god in the pantheon of the Drow. Uh, from that perspective, in and in broad terms, uh, I, isn't she like Moon and Luck, or is she Beauty? Something like that. Suspect he mightn't be kicked by a mule. Well, if he wasn't fussing around them stables when he ought not to. I know Marguerite. Marguerite would have taught him good not to go into them stables like he he woulda. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Marguerite, bless her heart, she tries so hard. <laughs> yeah, yep, we're just rocking in a rocking chair in the front porch. Actually, probably on one of the several porches around the house. Uh, <laughs> Derek says, so what makes your god so great? She dances naked in the moonlight, practicing swordplay, and is willing uh, for anyone to join her. <laughs> so... <laughs> The enemy of the drow made manifest. And and so in this sense, right, we have we have this druid who invoked this kind of openness, right? That they found refuge in joy. And then something happened that made her become well, we rolled a lich. And it could be a classic lich, undead, wrinkly skin and all that. You know, no, no amount of product from your, your neighbor Avon lady is going to gonna fix that. Um, implying the house isn't just entirely made of porch. <laughs> uh, she's the moon. It's considered holy light and domains are life, light, and nature. Oh. Pardon for the hiccup. 
So then with, with what Derek is saying with this little deeper dive, and this makes absolute sense because we have elements of astronomy and the sub boss character, the villain that we created is a moon druid, a moon druid. So something had happened and perhaps her people, despite being the good drow, didn't so much like the dalliances with the dragonborn. And so uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, giant crystal and structure exuded from the earth, from this volcano, her power, or rather this sort of avatar level godhood, this blessing from Elastrae herself was trapped. And so too was her lover torn from her. Because as we rolled for the villains, a hidden object holds the villain's soul. She wants to avenge the death or some other loss of a loved one. And of course that loved one is the ghost that visits. Um, she's dedicated to fulfilling a personal life goal. Her flaw is a forbidden love. And uh, she intends to get revenge through massacre, which unfortunately for the residents of Palisades is probably going to mean that this dormant volcano in which this hot springs uh, lake exists is going to erupt and is going to scorch the earth, you know, remake the mountain, melt the snow, destroy the bamboo grasslands, evaporate the water and just singe everything in, in a wrathful, um, you know, in a wrathful fit of revenge. One moment, she was a carefree child dancing like a moonbeam or running like a silver wolf through the forest. The next moment, she was either as seductive as a siren or as serious as a dwarven god. Oh. You know, in a sense, and and I, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't mean to break this uh, to, uh, I, I don't mean to, to break this to a, a very important matron in the drow. Uh, would you say that uh, that Fox's D and D time character might exhibit that kind of carefree uh, childishness that that I want to experience the world and I actually may want to have friends and I slip up on occasion and call them friends when uh, you know and then she corrupt uh, she uh, corrects herself and says oh no my minions are my peons could she perhaps be a secret follower or perhaps a divine vessel. But then again, she did uh, she did make a, a fiend pact with Levistus, so I suppose you got to keep things kind of hidden or legit, uh, you know, in, in front of the other drow. Keep in mind, um, Arash, Arashni is the old name of Lolth. This is how she speaks of her child. Oh, I, I did not know that, Derek. Uh, man, Derek is dropping some lore bombs on us that can only empower us to make even more compelling a story. Lo oh, I love that. Where's that lore icon from? Crit roll lore. Oh, there we go. Lore, indeed. Look at that. It just comes crashing down. Thank you for providing that, Misfit. And now I'm going over this because this is the important history to learn. We're going to want to delve into this. I wish I could explore the lore more in roleplay, but honestly, Drow gets such a bad rap that I just stopped trying. Uh, yeah, you, you'd need a group that is open to doing as such. You know, that is open-minded to this and, you know, maybe willing to lean into some stereotypes... Uh, but then, you know, overcome them through compelling storytelling and roleplay. Because you start with what people know, and then you pff, you get to bust through that. And that, that's what creates really strong memories in roleplay. So after this happens, we have this, uh, we have this undead, or in this case, perhaps even remortalized, um, half drow. Because uh, when when she ascended, right, she she had this uh, this bonding with this dragonborn character. Maybe that's why she's half. It, it could be even be like his body, in a sense, is with her, and that's why his soul is is the thing that kind of gets to escape after something happens that's involving the sub boss, and so the ghost is getting out because the ghost knows 
about the rage. The ghost knows about the plans because the villain had the key to get into the dungeon the whole time, as we were talking about on the session. Because the sub-boss, or the sub-villain, I should say, not really the boss of the dungeon. When we come up here, we have a, pu a pure drow, is a moon druid, and we rolled a sage astronomer. Great at solving puzzles, which, you know, star charts and such could present, as well as this maze prompt that we rolled for the dungeon. He is loyal to a benefactor as well. And that benefactor could be the goddess turned mortal, turned undead, or a semblance of such. Or someone else who perhaps seeks to free her and control her. So he is simply the middleman in this. And so we don't know, we don't know per se who our sub boss villain ultimately serves. But we know that he needs to get the players into this crystal in order to release the full powers of this of this quasi goddess druid fusion of a drow and dragonborn. Master Mage says, My human fighter grew up in an orphanage just so I don't have to explain why I get along with tieflings better than humans. Well, that's a reason, but if you ever need help thinking up of other reasons for stuff like that, you're always welcome to bring it up in chat here or in our RP workshop on our Discord. And we can help you if you think that there's something... You know, if you're if you're fine with that, but maybe you want something more uh, more compelling in some way, you wanted to explore a certain angle or a, a storytelling theme, you know, we'll we'll do our best with that. So the the cast is here. We have our map and of course our history. So the drow continued to exist, and the, and further down the river, the dragonborn existed. But there's always been this kind of disconnect until our other NPC came along and started uh, and was an ice monger as per gaming as usual suggestion and would buy or create ice and float it down the river but it was only mercantile right it was only just it was only just business and you know maybe history has been forgotten this person's not a bad person is providing income to the city and so sure <sighs> and then this ghost gets out and a, uh, a retired from injury military commander, um, uh, well, injury and I think age as well, uh, from what we rolled, uh, for because uh, he was uh, he was older, uh, ends up meeting with this ghost that in, is able to communicate this kind of uh, dread or something happening, and it's uh, it's only coming to this person who might end up resisting the ghost. This is an NPC who might resist the ghost or might be the only one who actually believes the ghost. Especially because as we roll, there's a circus in town. And that circus could be the player characters. That's a good introduction to get a, uh, to get a, a troop of people into town. Is they're all performers in a circus. They travel from town to town. They're all together anyway and know each other. And they have different skill sets that they can use. Right? A barbarian or a fighter or a paladin even could be a strong man. Um, you know, a wizard could make for a very good clown. Uh, you know, pull uh, you know, pull flowers out of people's noses. Hey guys, just finished the weekly home game. How did it go, Donnie? What what's the report? We go now live to Donnie's sorrow uh, from his home game, where the events that have taken place are as follows. Pray for my tongue, as I didn't realize how many jalapenos I was putting on these chips. Y'all gonna be spitting a powerful fireball. F-A-H-R-B-L-L. -L, fireball. You went great? So what was the clutch moment or phrase from that session? Kate Desu, hey! It's good to see you back. Welcome. It has been a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, grab a seat. Sit down. We're making a dungeon. 
So that's that's the history. <laughs> now, of course, I, I say that, right? Hey, we're just making a dungeon. By the way, we finished uh, recapping the work that we've put into the dungeon up to this point. Hotter than blue blazes. Now, are we talking, oh, sheeps, are we talking heavens to Betsy? Or are we talking heavens to Murgatroyd level? Mostly roleplay, the group managed to get their guild hall, uh, clear the basement of slimes and giant rats. Yeah, hey, Kate, yeah, hop aboard. If you have questions along the way, you're always welcome to ask. Just because we're presenting dungeon content doesn't mean you can't ask other world building or just, you know, general RP questions. Okay, so this is only Heavens to Betsy uh, levels of heat, not Heavens to Murgatroyd. And hello, Carl. Welcome. So hot, Asma Deus will blush. Oh, it may... We may... Hit, all right, everyone. Oh, sheeps may hit Murgatroyd level heat on her chips. Also, always feel free to drop questions. Yeah, exactly. And, and on Discord. We have plenty of RP mentors who would be would be absolutely happy to help and offer even different suggestions so that you have a buffet from which you may choose. Sliced jalapenos and then you put diced, diced jalapeno peppers. Heavens to Betsy, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So all of this has been building a story for us. And it, all it was was a series of random roles and a little imagination uh, to, to connect the dots. You can do this out there. So Kate, Kate, or if you, if you would prefer Des, absolutely, this process can help you out. If you, and all, the, all these worksheets and even the videos on how we made it, they're all on our Discord. You can download them for free. You don't have to subscribe or anything. It's there for you. <laughs> Now, what we had sketched out last night, uh, before I went over to D&D time to play in their third session, is that they would be given a way to enter, like a guaranteed way. So regardless of whatever the party was, we're building this dungeon in a way that we don't know the composition, which is actually a, a departure from how we generate content usually. And as such, we need to make sure that the dungeon in some way is accessible. And if, if through different means, that's fine. You know, if it was a group of wizards, a group of clerics, do they have a druid instead of a bard uh, doing healing and no cleric? Um, you know, is their rogue their tank? Because rogues are awesome tanks in 5th edition. That kind of a thing. Uh, West River Rat uh, says, I just made some habanero mango salsa. Going to let it sit until tomorrow and let it all meld. Oh, my goodness. Mango. I, I at BW3s, enjoy the mango habanero sauce that's there. You get the sweet. You get the heat. And overall, it's a good treat. I still keep a drink close by because it, it does get a little, ooh. That said, their wild is kind of weak in comparison. In my humble opinion. So, anyway... This sub-boss that has some kind of another plot in mind, right? Because maybe the sub-boss, for some reason, can't enter this place. And that might have to do with the fact that he's a druid as well, as, as we rolled our main villain to be. Or some other... I mean, I'll call it a contrivance. We're, DM, we're all DMs here. At least we're role-playing all DMs, so you get what I'm saying. Um, oh, read your last comment. Uh-oh, what did I miss? Uh, I read the one about they, they got their guild hall. Did I miss another one? Oh, shoot. There it is. Okay. Rolled a random bandit fight on the road that PC decides to follow them back to their camp and took out their leader and conscripted the bandits as workers for the guild hall. Oh, now how are they going to enforce the loyalty then? Because if they were already bandits, or is it because they're bandits and actually were looking for honest work that they decided, yeah, we'd rather get paid for an honest day's work than to put our lives at risk? There we see. Isn't that meta refry? We're role playing as dungeon masters.
Not up to my nephew's level. He snuck ghost pepper cheese onto the cheese tray at his brother's wedding. Oh, wow. <laughs> I hope no one, like, just fell over from that because, ooh, that, that's, that's hot. The bandits were farmers who were down on the... Oh, okay, gotcha. So they were looking to make an honest uh, an honest living and were probably uh, cajoled or uh, coerced uh, into such a thing. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, all right, so we got these. Now, with the concept of the dungeon we built, how can we assign portions of this to the concept or to the guideline, at least? Guideline, milestone, however you want to look at it. How would we do this? Well, an entrance with a guardian. In this case, um, nobody can enter the crystal without uh, both... The alignment of the stars being correct, as well as a tuning fork made from the same metal as, uh, I don't know, it's something that would link it here, uh, made from the same metal as the, ah, as what fell down with the quote-unquote moon drop that blessed... Uh, we didn't come up with a name for our, our villainess, um, but we'll say that blessed the villain from being a druid into a goddess. So it's a rare item uh, that this villain had procured in some way, gives to our players, and so the Guardian is just overall getting access to the crystal, like, to get inside the crystal. And the Guardian as well, um, or, you know, that actually might be the puzzle of the role-playing challenge right afterwards. Um, oh, uh, sorry, actually, all these ideas now are just starting to rush to my mind. Um, the villain is, in a sense, the Guardian as the PCs must enter into an agreement with him to gain whoop, access. Yes, <laughs> we have to bounce out rupee collecting. Thunny Star says, uh, the wizard is also an illusionist. Made a huge fake ritual that said if they lie, kill, or steal, they instantly die. And so I imagine then if you're talking to, you know, humble farmer folk, uh, you know, even press a digitation might be enough to really, you know, uh, scare the, you know, scare the loyalty into them. Here comes the spice breathing and the fan in mouth. And Coffee Cat now has wings, but they're not spicy. There's a Japanese saying that uh, someone who doesn't like hot stuff uh, is uh, has a cat's tongue. And Coffee Cat uh, is one of those people with a cat's tongue. It's in the name. <laughs> West Riverette says, my, in my world, adamantine is rare and only found in meteors. So yeah, it would be something that, you know, a key, an attunement that would be very rare or extremely circumstantial to get or find out about. Now, what about the concept of a puzzle or a role-playing challenge? Sure, we have the mace, uh, or the, the maze, uh, that's here. And then we have a puzzle room. Because we're, we're trying to... We want to tell the story about the struggle that this, uh, that this former goddess, if only for five minutes kind of a thing, right? She attained her powers, and then, you know, her own people... Uh, like locked her away because she was maybe in their eyes uh, corrupt or an abomination or something or it was honestly just an attack 
uh, it was an attack by uh, traditional drow. And I, I hope I don't make you cringe out there, Derek. By traditional drow who don't like followers of E.L. Uh And so as this ritual is taking place, uh, they, they triggered this trap to seal away her goddesshood. Uh, and so kind of the last blow was she struck down... She struck down most, if not all, of those drow, leaving the, the loyal ones. And so maybe our sub-boss is actually an agent of uh, of one of the loyal drow of Lolf or another one of the you know more obscure uh, drow uh, pantheon members who actually came and followed uh, this group to the Arctic Waste. And so that could explain why we have, we, uh, we have someone who is willing to free if only to then capture or even make the great sacrifice restore this uh restore this person back to her her goddesshood or even like a, a demigod status and then uh send her soul to someone or something else an idea would put some mtg that would be thematic uh hey throw the idea out there uh, we're, we're looking for this stuff for the dungeon What's the phrase for people like spicy? I don't know that offhand. Is there a link to this five room? Yes, 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 there is. And we're also going to go down this junk, this uh, dungeon checklist, which we referenced too. The killing was done through a summoning the massacre worm. Ah, well, you know. Uh, Derek, O'Sheeps is terribly, powerfully afraid of something that might exist in the depths of this Caldera Lake. And so what if that massacre worm uh, is waiting down there for its time to shine once more when it's, uh, when it's summoned? So we actually have a couple puzzles here. Uh, we have a, a maze that creates um, quote-unquote clones of the party that they must follow. Because it's actually a mirror maze. A mirror maze that creates clones of the party they must follow. This is to invoke a feeling of suspicion and paranoia that the... Oh, again, we don't have a name for this character yet, but the, the, the drow druid uh, felt as she was uh, amassing power. The clones disappear into an exit. And it's, it's more like a, a shadowy... The shadowy clones disappear into an exit leading the way out after harrying the party. From there, they enter a puzzle room where the party must figure out... Um, and... I don't have the riddle. If you all have an appropriate puzzle or riddle or something you want to put in here, um, all the, I mean, please uh, throw that out there. Something might inspire me, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping this is a good mutual storytelling here. But we go from a maze where we're kind of getting turned around. We wanted to invoke an emotion as we're telling the story of this, of this former slash quasi current goddess. Uh, and then they enter a puzzle room where she's figuring out and she finally gets that key uh, to, to solving things, which would then be, would probably involve the Dragonborn. Uh, from there, they enter a puzzle room where the party must figure out um, that dragon slash dragonborn um, are the answer to whatever the question is, as they'll find out later. After solving it, uh, they proceed to the next room where 
they get to uh, quote unquote meet the goddess. All right, Donnie. Yeah, we'll, we'll see you around. My partner would probably murder the clones instead of following. And but what if the clones were not murderable? Uh, what if they're simply uh, mirrors or reflections that don't necessarily have a corporeal body? I fixed that one by having all the damage the party did to their clones was also done to the party. And so, yeah, you could do that. Or because we're running this as a hall of mirrors in a crystalline structure, if, um, you know, it could be a reflection of damage uh, or of uh, spell effects or of uh, or something along those lines. And so, too, if they see one of these kind of shadowy clones of themselves running right, that must mean that they have to go left. Right? Because you're, you're figuring out kind of a basic puzzle, but then once they get the gist of it, they should be able to get their way through. Because we want the maze to symbolize this kind of confusion. Right? You start out, then suddenly there's, there's people, there's strangers around you that always seem to be following you, ducking around. You're not sure which way to go. And so after you get, in a, a, get a direction, you then find that you need allies in some sense, and that's the puzzle regarding the Dragonborn. Because again, we're telling the story of this villain. Uh, could be something simple like images of Dragonborn are etched or painted around sconces. Then you have to use a spell effect of the corresponding element. Uh, so something like that, yes. Uh, and if not relying on a spell effect, uh, which I don't mind as long as it's maybe somehow pre-broadcast, that, uh, that you'd need thaumaturgy uh, specifically to color fire, though you might be able to get away with it with uh, druid craft, and we're talking about kind of a druidic something. Um, or if... Uh, or if throughout the maze there are plants that can be identified somewhat easily as being uh, colored dyes, that then uh, they would have to you know collect, they'd have to collect the the different colors of the plants that they can then sprinkle the leaves into the fires in the next room. Very much river rat, and and with this initial room, you know the point's not to separate them and kill them. Now, there's plenty of death opportunities later, uh, but it's a good way to, to get them in the mood to be on guard. You might need to look around. Uh, there are suspicious people around. Uh, and of course, too, what, what if the Shadow Clone is simply, uh, you know, you know, the reflection of the damage might not even be the damage to you. But if everyone has this mirror image and you attack, you know, if I'm Sally and then Sue is around the corner, but, you know, Sue appears as a shadow and I poof, and I shoot a lightning bolt, I'm actually, you know, through that shadow or through that mirror clone, uh, I'm actually attacking my party member who could be elsewhere. Yeah, now is not the time for fear, Doctor. That comes later. <laughs> Yeah, illusory eyes, something along those lines. So then we, we get to this dragon slash dragonborn uh, puzzle. And and now this room, if we're following the green arrows, this room, the puzzle room, leads to this room of kind of self-actualization, right? So they get to meet the goddess. And they, uh, and they uh, through some creative box text or an equivalent of box text, uh, might see how she acts and it could deliver a key phrase or a key interaction. So it's almost a game of, sh of charades or if they realize that she's looking to be lauded and worshipped uh, in some way, then they know that they should bow before this uh, this illusion. And if they don't, then they would have to, uh, you know, then there's a penalty for making her wroth, W-R-O-T-H, not R-O-T-H, which is the uh, the... <laughs> The deferred retirement account. Um, and so there's a penalty. Like, it's not necessarily a difficult encounter, but there's a penalty if you're not paying attention to what's going on around you currently or perhaps even a bit in the past. There could even be a David Lee Roth involved if you really want it to, Pouty Lips. <laughs> Be genius for you as my party members like to rip each other during combat anyways, and my party is coming up to a Mad Mage's Tower soon. Yeah, please, Misfit, all this is going to be put out there for everyone to borrow from as they'd like to. 
So then they get to meet the goddess. Uh, here they must uh, speak or act in a certain way. Else a uh, penalty be paid. Probably a room-wide quote-unquote nuke. Uh, which, after it resolves the, um, after it resolves, the way forward opens. Now, something you can do here, because depending on the level, we haven't said that this is level 1 or level 17. Uh, you might have, uh, you might have, uh, you know, someone who, you know, can save for half or save for none. If this is, you know, making a goddess wrathful then you might tell everyone you're all taking 20 radiant damage. Now, if you can mitigate the radiant damage, you can do so, but there's no way to avoid this because the entire room is filling up. There's no deck save. You can't dodge out of the way of this. You know, it, it's like uh, if you're stuck in a microwave, you're trying to dodge your way from between the, the radiation. Uh, so now it's the time uh, it, it's the time for ascension and so we have a trick or a, 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 this this could be either puzzle or the role-playing challenge but as we're getting through you know we have six rooms here this could be a good chance for something like a trick or a setback and so here uh, we have really this would almost be more of a narrative because this could challenge the things that they were told and reveal to them that they might have been duped by that person who got them in here. Uh, so this could simply be a large cutscene where the moon and stars are right and the PCs watch the um, uh, drow goddess uh, merge, and that could be, you know, a magical merging, or that could just simply be uh, a PG way to insinuate uh, she, remember, she fell in love. Uh, she fell in love with a dragon and or dragonborn, and so depending on the context at your table, this could be a scene that it, it could feature um, you know, an, an intimate encounter, and yet it's still meaningful to the story. Because, you know, things happen on the altar and there's, you know, moonbeams reflecting up and the stars are just right in the sky. Um, or the moon is hidden until the clouds part. And finally at the, we'll just say climax of the ritual, whatever you want it to be, that's on you, not me. At the climax of the ritual, the moon shines down on, on her. And, and so this druid, this drow druid becomes this half druid form. Um, as, you know, her body, as her druid body absorbs the body of the dragon or the dragonborn the, whom she loved. And perhaps that's when things, um, you know, aren't going necessarily the way that they should. Or even if it's a dragonborn and is a descendant, because we're going to have an encounter with a dragon of sorts here. And a good way of doing that, if we have this trick or setback, you know, you get your players in as you're describing a scene that could be beautiful and intimate. It could just be a big, a big, you know, a soundstage uh, sized uh, scene of a, a drow ritual, but one that's beautiful. What was Derek talking about? Derek was talking about Elastre, even, you know, even described by Lol, her own mother. As you know, being this beautiful, like beautiful naked woman that's dancing in the in the moonbeams, you know, it's not really even sexual. It's just it's freeing. It's being it's being free and and absorbing the light and the love and the life that's around you, without fear or constraints. And of course, who would know about having a natural body but a druid in this case? So, I mean, again, tailor it to your table. You could you could take this prompt in a lot of different directions. And and there, you know, gaming as usual uh, last night described a scene that, you know, because it was taking place in a in a store and there was a lot of kids around, uh, there was a very, uh, from what he was saying, a graphic representation of a sexual scene. 
you know, that in itself, that in itself doesn't have to be bad in role playing. Now, the the venue and especially the way it was handled in the venue, as described by Gao, uh, was inappropriate. But you know, so Oshif, you're saying that was lovely. Just because it's a dungeon doesn't mean everything has to be creepy. If you walked into this room, and now this this woman that you've been learning about, you've been getting the feeling that there's been people working against her. She's and then she looks outside her own people, these dark shadows, and she sees hope with the dragonborn. You know, then you have this realization, this ascendancy as she, you know, she travels to them. And so in this case, you're kind of role playing maybe as the dragonborn who are bowing and welcoming her. Then we have this beautiful cutscene of a, of a sorts that plays out. Now, of course, as you're describing this, could you sprinkle some clues as to where she's gotten her powers or perhaps how she's defeated? You know, as she's going to turn into a threat later. I mean, we as DMs know this, right? Wink. We're role playing as DMs. But as you describe this scene and everything else, there could be some consistencies that continue to show up. I do this in my Tuesday game, by the way. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, you know, things happen that, that seemingly have uh, this repetition. You, you make this beautiful scene, and then, you know, the scene stops. And so that's the trick or setback is, is now the way forward opens. And you've been through several rooms. And yet it seems like the exit is, is before you. And like, oh, so we, we've solved it. You no, know, she seems pleased. It looks like she might have been uh, ascended to goddesshood from this beautiful ritual and, and all this. The door opens and then it slams behind the last one. And now we have... Um, and now we have... The big climax... The dragon fight. And that could be with an illusory dragon. Or it could be with the real one. It could be the ghost uh, that was manifest actually comes here. And the fight is necessary to remove the glamour from the party's eyes. Because they need to see that she's not as sweet, pure, and innocent as the wind-driven snow druid. Or, or even as they got to know the local drow, who the ones here are really laid back. You know, they're, the drow here are not like the drow you'd meet in many other locations. And so this ghost, this warning ghost that, that arguably started everything here, you know, signaled the live uh, NPC that, that got the party members coming here. But he needs to show them that also there are some real ramifications. There is destruction. They need to be ready for a fight. And so the spirit of this lost love, because if she absorbed the body of, of her lover... You know, through this ritual magic and, you know, being a druid and, and ascending to goddesshood or a quasi state of it. He needs to keep it real. This is the big climax and he's playing for keeps because, you know, if, if everyone's going to die anyway. So if someone can survive whatever a ghost can throw at him, then they at least halfway stand a chance of proceeding. And if he kills him, eh. And so this could be taken in a couple ways. This could either be a straight up slobber knocker uh, battle of attrition till one side uh, one side falls over and the other side is standing. This could be uh, simply endure and role play with all the context clues that they've learned up to this point. Maybe the name of the dragon. Maybe we understand what she went through. Speak to us. You know, as he like strafes them with fire or whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and they're proving that they have the resolve to weather any storm. And so we have several options, much like the prompt had had recommended. You have wise or intelligent characters that could do this. You have charismatic characters. You just have uh, strong or dexterous characters that can just dodge or take the hits and soak them up. And so the dragon fight can be done in many ways to convey that same, I need to know the people who are here to help are strong. Otherwise, we're all dead anyway, and I'm doing them a favor before they are consumed in the fires, in the, uh, I'm going to use the vocabulary word, in the wrathful fires, furs. All right, that's probably going to recommend wrathful, uh, worthful. At least that's what it is. I, I, I like Rolf, anyway. 
Yeah, take the hits, exactly. And so th that's the climactic fight in this dungeon. After seeing beauty, after solving mystery, after being paranoid, and, and seeing that there's this look outside. Excuse me, sir, can I help you? Well, everyone, there's your cat butt. He had to join us sometime, right? That's a good old-fashioned throat scritching. I ain't gonna make him like this no more. You're probably gonna give me a little wheeze after this, though. That's how that's how good these th these throat scritchings are. Oh, you're good. I guess you you, you tank that like a pro. All right, and then finally, so here is going this is going to lead to the exit of the dungeon but not the the dungeon style encounter the reward or revelation uh this is going to be in our princess is in another castle as they see that the image from this room over here walks into this room and the shadowy figures from this room walk into this room. And then another scene plays out where the shadowy figures that were undermining her strike and they strike her down and a battle plays out that the PCs might have to survive or just even witness, which is fine too. And of course, this is what the, this is what the, the dragon was trying to prepare them for the treachery that then led to her goddesshood being stripped from her and perhaps even culminating in the form of this crystal. And so, you know, a crystal shows growing, but it could actually be the exit to the, uh, it could be the exit to this room, but they have a limited amount of time to escape through the crossfire. Um, you know, as people are just jumping out and attacking, um, and, uh, and they're indiscriminately attacking because this is this is to represent the, that uh, that treachery or that rival clan of Drow have finally infiltrated and have decided to strike. And so they're going to murder any follower of Elastrei, let alone the, the goddess host. You good, bud? Am I helping working out a... Uh, am I working out a, a furball in your throat here? Yep. You give him a good throat scratch and he kind of goes, <laughs> but nothing comes of it. So I kind of hope it's like it's loosening the junk in his throat. Anyway. Uh, and so now everything in the dungeon is can come together in this last segment. And so hopefully they've been paying attention. And then she escapes. And, and none of the clones leave uh, because she would then turn around and seal, right? She'd seal the door. Um, even though it's sort of like an illusory or phantom self. And oh, by the time the players escape through the exit, they see these kind of ghostly footprints that lead down the other side of the mountain in the fresh snow where the snow exists and see that it goes to this volcanic chimney that used to have the, the sacred statues uh, put up there. Um, and now they've been sullied by, uh, by an evil force. Well... That's probably the druid who originally would have had a druid circle on such a natural area. And since her fall, you know, since she was betrayed and these followers of Lolth or another god or goddess in the, of the drow, or are they all goddesses in the drow pantheon? Derek, is there a male? Is there a, a male fashioned god in the drow pantheon? There, okay, there is. Oh, it's uh, Elastrae's brother. Okay. So, wait, what does he represent then? Uh, because uh, because of how matriarchal that society is, what role does her brother play in, in the Pantheon? Or is he the good boy and she was the rebel daughter who kind of ran off and did her own thing? 
quick glare into the camera for two... Yeah, you gotta play to the camera, oh, sheeps. Uh, sorry, I missed some other chat here. Uh, Oldport says, a jeweled and metallic jack-in-the-box. When opened, it's a boxing glove on a spring. 1d4 bludgeoning damage. <laughs> but it's unavoidable. <laughs> Unmitigatable, unavoidable. I think he's kind of a rebel as well, but more undermining. Oh, so he plays like a good son, but he's trying to undo things from the inside. And so what this means now, right? Right. The 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 footprints. Dis <laughs> we have yellow snow, everyone. Um, so the, the footprints disappear after a while, and the party then sees that they must go to this next place. Now, this is where you can make the decision as the dungeon master. Where does the dungeon begin and where does the dungeon end? As the dungeon isn't just when the door opens on one side and then opens on the next. The dungeon can begin as soon as that uh, that astronomer NPC, or not NPC, well, a villain's an NPC. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. As soon as the astronomer villain hands him that tuning fork or whatever and says, you know, the stars will be right for three hours. You must strike the tuning fork to the crystal and get through before, um, you know, before this happens. Otherwise, you could be sealed in here uh, at least for another uh, two nights until things are right. And then they won't be right again. You know, in other words, we are we're, we're creating a time constraint. And so ultimately the boundary of the dungeon is the time constraint that we are giving them. You know, to that sense, and I'm not I'm absolutely not spoiling anything for Tomb of Annihilation because this is page 1. Um time, well actually, pff, I could argue time's not a constraint in Tomb of Annihilation, but ultimately there is a timely constraint in Tomb of Annihilation which could make the entire adventure almost seem like a dungeon. Because you have to keep moving. You have to manage your resources from day one. You have to be, uh, sh uh, you know, sharp-witted. You have to be quick. Or the timer begins when... Bum, that tuning fork strikes when the stars are right. And then until the moon passes from, you know, passes from, uh, you know, uh, a, a one quarter on the horizon here to one quarter on the horizon there. Because we're tying this to the moon, we're tying this to the stars, because it's thematic to what we wrote, and the story writes itself, everyone. All this week and in weeks prior, we have our oo-woos, we have our o-woes, and in this channel we have ewees. It writes itself, Iwi. This story absolutely wrote itself. The NPCs and villains and dungeon, everything gets along with each other because of the process that we took. It writes itself, Iwi. <laughs> if only my NaNoWriMo's would write themselves. <laughs> that might be a fun thing to do in November, though. Anyway, <laughs> Iwi, oh, whoa. Oh, whoa? Ewe? Oh, whoa. <laughs> N nani? <laughs> A2 Brute. I'm, I'm sorry to, uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, we have an Ewe now, Derek. And then when does the dungeon end, right? If our princess is another castle. We have seen what's happened and where to go, but maybe we can't because, I mean, we could climb the chimney. In fact, all, a lot of NPCs might have. They don't see anything out of the ordinary, but we're talking with, with cosmic forces. We're talking about something like a Stonehenge, which is an astral uh, or a solar calendar. And so the time is growing, the time is growing right. And we're not necessarily getting all, you know, uh, Cthulhuan with this. I mean, they're, they're, you know, the stereotype, the stars are right, but we've, we can invoke this. 
we can have this play into things. And of course, this is its own dungeon. This is probably where the final boss confrontation takes place, honestly. And whether or not this is one level, half a level, or ten levels before that, we at least know. And we've been through this, and what this could mean is we've unlocked something. Maybe we've grabbed something because we've been asked to grab something while in the crystal as a side quest. Of course, we can put it along the way, and whether they do or not, eh, it's a side quest still. But that's our, our reward or our revelation. We've learned about the circumstances. Now we can ask questions and maybe ask some uncomfortable questions in town, especially with the native drow, who themselves might only be, you know, uh, kids of, uh, of, of the, you know, the, the parents or the grandparents that came before when all this happened, you know, and they thought that it was buried and that it would be forgotten. And, you know, it lies dormant with the volcano. And who, who could make a volcano explode? Hint, a very powerful land druid, by the way. And that was randomly rolled. It writes itself. Anyway. So what do we have going on in here for the seven elements? We have our five rooms, quote unquote. We, we've told a story. We've brought all of the, the story thematic elements together. So what are some things in here that we can, that we can use? Something to steal? Well, we have that side quest item, and we have been asked to take something of value, um, which could be a complimentary moon drop, kind of like a, you know, so it'd be like a yin-yang thing, and so uh, the the villain uh, has a yin, and we have to get the yang from inside. Uh, something to steal could also, remember, that could be knowledge. Remember the prompt. It could be knowledge as well. Um, however, I think for a, a physical object... Uh, I do not plot. It plots all by itself. I like it, Derek. I like it. I like it. I love it. I need it. Something to steal. Um, a precious side artifact um, for the sub-villain. Uh, think Jafar in... Sorry, spoilers for what? Is it like a 20-year-old cartoon now? Ugh. Maybe even a little older. Uh, uh, think Jafar in disguise. Uh, you know. Touch nothing but the lamp. Uh, or uh, Slash, uh, you know, give me the lamp. Kind of a thing. Something to be killed. What are the gribblers in here? And it, it could be something, you know, it could be monsters to put down. And of course, we have, um, you know, we have uh, something like the the clones, which could possibly, you know, was brought up before, could be defeated. Maybe someone fires a scorching ray to clone, and in reward, the clone dies, and so too does the player character take the damage by defeating that clone or whoever's clone, like shadow clone, like drow clone, it was. So something to be killed, uh, the stalking clones. Something to kill you. The dragon. Oh, is it just 1F? Am I just thinking of Jaffa Cakes? Oh, a Jaffa Cake sounds really good right now. Anyway. different paths so what can we do in this case it's a cursed tea time tree it's cursed it, you better have a story behind that otherwise uh, old port uh, I'm gonna have to call you out on calling Jaffa cakes a cursed item now the different paths this can be accomplished in a, in a few different ways and if you wanted to make a sort of a, a sub different path for each of the rooms you can. In fact, we even uh, we even uh, discussed some possibilities. You know, for the maze, the maze, it could be follow the clones until you get to the end of the maze. You know, see if you kill them or not. Or, if you have a strong character who maybe isn't quick or skilled with uh, navigation, what if the maze doesn't take up, you know, floor to ceiling? What if a strong character simply climbs on the top of the maze and does what most people in Zelda, you know, Breath of the Wild do. 
and they just solve solve the maze by walking on top of the walls. So that's a different path that could be taken to solve, quote unquote, solve the maze. The puzzles might have a couple different answers. The worship could take place in the form of maybe giving something of value to this image of this of this beautiful drow maiden. Um, or it could be in the way something is said, or it could be in the way that as the parade goes on, uh, you you mentioned it looks like someone from the crowd, a shadowy figure, because we want to have those shadowy figures pop up, right? A shadowy figure runs up and tries to, um, I was going to say try to pounce her, but that could be something completely different, um, and tries to assault her. And so that could have a, a figure, like someone who's figured out I should be polite, but how do I, you know, I'm not a very charismatic person. You know, I'm Croc the Barbarian. Oh, I'm going to smash this dude. Then, ooh, just absolutely lay out. Uh, absolutely just lay out the shadow. And that earns the favor and solves that uh, as an alternative instead of waiting out the illusion or whatever. Um, now, do you have to have an alternative for everything? No. Sometimes watching the entire cutscene, look, you're going to get through it anyway. It's whether or not you choose to take notes. Uh, then you come to the dragon. We mentioned several different paths through the dragon fight. You know, through endurance, uh, which Derek, Derek uh, is good for endurance. Um, it could just be, you know, besting in combat. It could be uh, piecing clues together from an intelligence standpoint. And then lastly, we come to this. Everything is coming together and it's just a hodgepodge. And that could just either be it's different paths because random elements from each of these other rooms are going to occur. Or because you're going to get to the end anyway, it's more or less. Can you survive or in which sh in what shape are you getting out? Uh, they stale incredibly quickly compared to other similar items, specifically uh, your OG variant Jaffas or Jaffa Cakes. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Pims. Uh, Pims hard chocolate versions don't have those. Other company have seemed to have not gotten that issue uh, that the first does. Also, bourbon creams are greater than Jaffa. Hashtag just saying. I, I can't say I've had a bourbon cream. Uh, who's that made by Old Port? Someone to talk to? Autom we have several people in this dungeon. Oh, it's a type of biscuit. Okay. Well, I'll have to look for it then. A bourbon cream. Now, by 50 different companies, like, is this like a... Do I need to go to an upscale grocery store? Or is this something I could find a bourbon cream in Walmart? Or in, you know, kind of my, my local... My local grocery store? Or supermarket. I don't know how regional that is. Some, you know, whatever. Six to one, half, half dozen to the other. Someone to talk to. We have plenty of people to talk to here. Including the villain who's probably awaiting for us on the other end. And maybe that's another villainous clue. How did he know? How, like, he just took him and said, oh, this is a random side. Um, you know, I'll... And I'll, I'll wait for you. And seemingly he was waiting right at the exit to receive this property. Oh, oh um, uh, lucky, I guess. It was in the stars. So even including the sub-villain or the main villain herself and, or an iteration of her, there's plenty of people to talk to in this dungeon. Now, something to experiment with. The puzzle could very well be just that. Your local Indian shop stocks 10 brands, English section of grocery stores. Like sub Oreo prices, okay. Um, I will do my best to look for it in the international sections of my of. Uh, we have several. Uh, let's see, we have a we have a Walmart Super Center, a Meyer, M E I J E R, which is more of a Midwest thing, and uh, Kroger. Uh, Kroger's also Midwest. Now we don't have nothing fancy like a Publix. Or Piggly Wiggly. So we gotta settle for our Kroger. Um, there is a Sam's Club. There is a Sam's Club in town. I I don't think the next Costco isn't uh, or uh, actually uh, I don't think the next wholesaler, uh, which is a Costco or a BJ's. That's the name of the store now. Come on. Um, 
a Costco or a BJ's aren't around until I think you start getting out towards Cleveland? Question mark? Indicated by my voice going up at the end of the sentence? A Kroger with a clothing department and a wine tasting bar. Yeah, it's, it's a fancy. Next thing you know, they'll put in one of them cement ponds that you go swimming in inside that place. Have to wear my Sunday britches to it. Oh, we have a Target. We also have a Target in town. There you go. A Target, if you want to sound fancy about it. So, something to experiment with? Hmm. Well... It could be with the uh, with the interaction. You know, are you going to get a scowl? Are you going to get zapped? Uh, are you going to reset the illusion? Uh, you could experiment perhaps with whatever the puzzle is here, which is how we could involve one of the myriad traps that we can either devise ourselves. Or look, real quick pro tip, Dungeon Master's Guide, the trap section is extremely short because 5th edition is amazingly open for you to make whatever trap you want. You set the damage and difficulty class to the level spread and have anything else happen that you want. Easy as that. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. In my humble opinion. And so what is something the players probably won't find? What is something the players probably wouldn't find in this dungeon? Could it be a... a could it be something that, what if during the parade, you know, an earring dropped? They're lo- Oh my gosh. <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> just keep it nice and easy. You look at the camera and you just say, Y'all. That's, that's what Dark Wolf does to us also, but... <laughs> the Offspring... Oh! West Riverette. So that uh, that could very well be. And, I mean, so if not maybe living, it could be... It could be a mummified remains. Um, yeah. And that could be very... That could be the key to not easy-moding the final boss, per se, but that could do a lot of things. Um, you know, or if she absorbed, uh, if she absorbed the physicality of her dragon or dragonborn lover in that merging of her becoming a goddess, a drow goddess, but she becomes this half drow as a savior of her people from the followers of Lulth or the other nefarious ne'er-do-well, uh, drow gods and goddesses. It could be remains of an offspring. It could be remains of the lover. It could, again, be something that in one of the illusions you saw... So maybe one of the attackers actually get to her. And uh, and so as you describe her going on after the attacker is subdued, whether by other illusions or a party member, she doesn't have her bracelet. And that bracelet, uh, that bracelet could do something interesting story-wise or mechanically. The offspring of... Yeah, oh, and a very good hook, uh, West River Rat. Diagram charts, yeah, especially of uh, star, like star alignments and such. Um, plenty of intellectual material, and we're talking, you know, ascension. We're, we could talk like, oh, there's stardust, or there's moon rocks. Uh, very powerful, um, you know. So uh, on that stage uh, where the 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 consummation of her goddesshood or something else uh, had happened, there could also be a moon rock or something that could empower a spell, act as. Uh, as a very rare item or an artifact here or something like that. And and yes, knowledge accident, uh, absolutely. Something the players probably won't find is a clue that they don't know is a clue until they could use it later in the future. That's happened on Tuesday. <laughs> Hashtag just saying. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely. Now, for fun things like the maze where you want to uh, you want to test people's dexterity and strength and all that, that's when we can bust open uh, something like uh, Grimtooth's traps. You know, hop, skip, and a jump, and you put that down. You maybe want to make a gas passage 
in the in the Hall of Mirrors maze that we're going through. Um, there's a theft-proof gem. Oh, how about that? Um, uh, there's a lightning gem. So maybe so. What 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 is the lightning gem on page? On page forty-two. Whoops. Uh, the lightning gem found atop a pile of ashes on a table takes the form of a huge and beautiful fire opal set in a golden ring. The gem is obviously magical, but the exact nature of the enchantment is protected from detection. The gem is ensorcelled. Oh, I love that word. The gem is ensorcelled so that if it is ever lifted above the wearer's head, it will call forth a powerful bolt of lightning, causing considerable damage to the bearer. The gem will remain intact no matter how many times it's struck by lightning. The GM should give no hint as to what the gem will do until such a time the wearer fulfills the condition of placing the ring above his head. <laughs> I <laughs> This is a very fun item. <laughs> Tuesday, hashtag just saying. And so the heavens wept with the falling of the diamond stars. Uh, the idiot's vase, as Old Port is pointing out here. Another of Ken's treasures is the idiot's vase, which will point out how stupid some delvers can be. The item is an enchanted crystal vase. 80 gold pieces are visible inside. The vase itself radiates negative magical vibes. Whoever carries the vase will lose two strength points per turn. Whoever breaks the vase will lose six intelligence points. Whoever reaches into the vase will turn blue unless he is already blue, in which case he turns green. All attribute losses and changes are permanent. The way to defeat this trap is painfully simple. Merely turn the vase upside down and pour the gold out. Delvers whose mentalities are geared to destruction will seldom think of this. Oh, and Satan's bow? This, so the string is enchanted uh, to not look like the razor wire that it is. And so when the person goes to pull back the arrow, it actually is like sharp piano wire that goes through the fingers. Ah, a warforged? Okay. So yeah, you know, if you have a goddess who needs help and wants her helpers to be comp uh, competent, go through here and put in a cursed magic item. Uh, put in, uh, you know, uh, oh, here's the uh, jerk with the box in instead of the jack in the box that uh, Old Port was talking about, the jerk in the box. It's a jack in the box that punches you in the face when it opens. Uh, challenge bandits to be worthy and watch. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. All right, everyone. I got to get up and... Um, I, I'm going to take a, uh, a little break here to refresh myself. And so I will, I'll tell you what, um, yeah, well, I'll come back and, and we can, we can spend uh, the remaining uh, bit of time we have together uh, looking at devious traps from here. But I think overall in our workshop, we did an amazing job. I'm super happy with this dungeon. And look, this is just as much a dungeon map as anything you'll find in Curse of Strahd or Tomb of Annihilation. Just because it looks simple and we use an uh, MS Paint document, a Word document, doesn't mean that we don't have an amazing and compelling dungeon. The dungeon tells a story. The dungeon aids the rest of the story that we can tell. And it, it all comes together. So anyway, hold tight, refresh yourselves, and when we come back, let's amuse ourselves and look at some fun traps uh, from Grimtooth, shall we? I think we shall. <laughs> 